So welcome to KU Paatshala. Uh, today I intend to take a part of the uh, renewable energy technologies paper. The renewable energy technology uh, paper is actually offered uh, from the renewable energy center of the University of Kerala. Uh, the focus of the paper is primarily to teach you about different renewable energies, the sources and the technologies which are used for uh, energy generation. So I will be taking uh, a part of the module 3 of the course uh, today. Uh, the module 3 actually consists of uh, solar energy which is basically divided into two parts as um, solar thermal and uh, photovoltaic systems. So we will start off with one uh, basic uh, question. So where do we stand in space? So if you look at uh, space, we are located uh, somewhere at the uh, edge of uh, the galaxy uh, typically around uh, a trajectory around the sun which powers all our activities. So if you look at the earth as a system, the system is actually powered by sun which is our ultimate uh, source of energy. Without the sun, we cannot uh, survive on our planet. Now if you look at the sun's uh, energy which is received by the earth. Uh, we can divide it into different forms which actually uh, propagates life on this planet. Um, we have uh, developed technologies uh, which are uh, based on the energy which is received from the sun. Now uh, moving to some fundamental basics, say without sunlight we cannot anticipate to have uh, life on earth. Now I think some uh, misconceptions are there that. Uh, Earth is located at an ideal uh, distance from the sun which has actually enabled life to uh, sustain on earth. No, it is a combination of a number of uh, parameters which has enabled a life to be sustained on earth. Now uh, the presence of uh, sunlight along with carbon dioxide and uh, water has actually enabled the production of um, biomass actually on earth. Uh, see carbon dioxide is available on Mars, uh, but water is not available on Mars. So without uh, water, but in the presence of sunlight and carbon dioxide, we do not have uh, the carbon hydrogen form uh, of any organic matter on Mars. So it is the presence of these ideal combinations which has enabled uh, life or you say anything organic uh, to be uh, developed on the surface of earth. So, uh, biomass. So, if you look at biomass, biomass was the most uh, earliest form of energy that man used. Combustion of uh, biomass was used uh, to fuel uh, his cooking purposes. So, the most fundamental form of energy which is biomass energy is again uh, propelled by uh, the sun. So, without sunlight uh, you cannot anticipate any kind of organic matter to be formed. So, the effect of sunlight cannot be uh, negated in case of uh, the biomass or biomass energy specifically. You will think about uh, wind, see uh, the flow of air is what we call as wind. So and how do you think uh, there is motion of air? So unless there is sun which actually uh, heats up the atmosphere because of uh, its uh, infrared radiations from the sun. The atmosphere undergoes a cycle which actually uh, results in uh, the generation of wind. So without the sun there is no air primarily and without the sun there is no wind and wind is again a form of energy that we have uh, exploited to generate uh, electricity. Uh, next if you look at uh, the oceans you can speak you all of you know that we always get uh, waves on the ocean right. So if the sun was not there we cannot anticipate uh, the uh, tidal motion of water which is again exploited to uh, obtain uh, electrical energy. And uh, looking again to our own source of electricity which is uh, like if you look at Kerala uh, we have uh, 80, 80 percent of our electricity need is met from hydro projects which is again uh, from what rain. So without the sun you cannot anticipate evaporation from water sources which is actually uh, converted into rain and you store it into a dam. So again what I want to stress here is that the sun is a primary source of energy to all our fundamental activities and without the sun we cannot think about sustaining our life. 
Now, we have technologies which are coming into place which actually exploit the sun directly. Now, what I have just now spoken is about indirect utilization of uh, sun by different uh, methodologies. My talk today would uh, concentrate on how the sun can be or how the sun is being used currently to generate electricity directly because all our activities are dependent on power. If you look at even the situation where right now we have corona and we are stuck in our own offices and homes and still uh, the economy is moving forward basically because you have plenty of electricity which is coming into your homes, you have electricity coming into your mobile phones, you have electricity onto your laptops and you are processing the electricity to generate your data and this data economy is what which is pushing the world in this uh, epidemic. So, without electricity we cannot think about uh, any kind of development in our life and solar energy is primarily an area which is actually flourishing which concentrates on evolving or utilizing the sun's energy for generation of electricity. So, two of the areas that I would be uh, technically handling today would be on converting the sun's uh, energy into either uh, electricity directly or indirectly using different methodologies. So, primarily we will have to start with the sunlight. Now, uh, the sun if you can imagine is basically uh, a ball of fire, but it is a misconception again, it is not a ball of fire actually. Uh, imagine that uh, say my mass, if I am completely converted into energy in a second or uh, the same thing happens on uh, the sun that is say I am around 70 kilos. So, around 70 kilos of hydrogen is actually being converted into uh, helium on the surface of the earth every second. This conversion is actually fueling the kind of energy which is coming to us. The energy that we receive on earth is primarily in terms of light and heat which we need to uh, trap using any available technology to generate electricity. So, uh, the light which is coming to earth is primarily uh, we measure it in terms of uh, two quantities which are called as uh, air mass uh, intensities. Now, what is this air mass? Now, as you know as the sun uh, rises in the morning, uh, it has uh, the light which uh, passes or moves from the sun. Uh, takes the longest distance to reach us, whereas when the sun comes directly above our head it is the shortest distance. So, uh, we can actually measure the kind of light intensity that we receive on the earth in terms of this propagation distance. This propagation distance is measured in terms of air mass basically because of the amount of distance it travels through the atmosphere to reach us. Normally, we uh, define two quantities which is air mass uh, 1 and air mass 1.5. Uh, to come to that uh, you can actually uh, look into our basic uh, studies where we study about uh, black body radiation. Now, if you look at this uh, graph which you see, you can actually see what the black body radiation is. Now, if you compare the black body radiation to the spectrum from the sun which consists of uh, uh, radio waves or sorry not radio waves, but uh, in terms of um, wavelengths which move from say from the ultraviolet region to the uh, infrared region. This uh, wavelength spectrum that you can get from the sun consists of typically from around 185 nanometers to around 3000 nanometers and beyond. In this the amount of light that we get what we can visualize with our eyes is called as the visible radiation which lies between around 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Now, beyond uh, 400 to around say from 400 uh, nanometers to around 200 nanometers we call that to be the UV region whereas from 700 nanometers to beyond uh, say 3000 nanometers we call it to the IR and the far IR region of the spectrum. Now, the far IR and the IR region of the spectrum is what actually gives us heat, it is what we perceive as uh, heat primarily. The ultraviolet region uh, does not give us heat, but it can actually lead to uh, as all of us know uh, UV radiations which can lead to cancer on skin cancers and fissures on the skin as possible. The visible region which is primarily between 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers is the region that we are actually concentrating on. Now, if you look at this graph here, you can see 
the measurement that is actually done on uh, the amount of uh, radiation from the sun which is measured out of the atmosphere which is basically the air mass 1.5. This AM 1.5 graph if you look at it, it consists of lot of dips which is actually uh, regions which come from uh, absorption which are taking place. Similarly, you have also the spectrum which is uh, AM 1 which actually refers to the uh, radiation which is received on the surface of the earth. Now, as light propagates through the atmosphere, we have ozone, we have carbon dioxide, we have water vapor, all these actually absorb the radiations and uh, we get only uh, say typically around only 70 percent of the radiation which is coming from the sun directly reaches the surface. The rest is actually absorbed and scattered around uh, 18 percent of the light which actually propagates uh, from the sun is actually uh, 18 percent is actually uh, absorbed whereas uh, 6 percent is scattered. Uh, the statistics of this is shown in this uh, graph which clearly shows that uh, the scattering component actually comes back uh, to the earth itself which is actually what we call as the greenhouse effect because of uh, the gases which actually trap these heat radiations which are reflected off the surface of the earth and again collected by the atmospheric gases and again re-emitted back to the surface. So, this kind of greenhouse effect gases are also contributing to the heat radiation which are received by us. So, these atmospheric uh, effects contribute to increasing the temperature around us. Now, solar radiation as I was saying uh, is measured fundamentally in terms of an F parameter uh, which is directly uh, measured in terms of the amount of intensity received per unit area on the surface of earth. Now, typically the quantity is around 1300 milliwatt per centimeter square, 1300 milliwatt per centimeter square is the amount of energy uh, that we receive on the surface of earth. Now, in interesting calculation that can be done uh, is that if we uh, look at the sun as the source of energy which is emitting radiations and measure the total amount of radiation which is being received by the surface of the earth. This works out to be around uh, 3.9 to 10 raised to 26 watts that is 3.9 to 10 raised to uh, 26 joules per second is the amount of energy which is received on the surface of the earth every second. And if you look at how much of energy is consumed by us in a year is only around uh, 10 terawatts. So, uh, you can estimate the amount of energy that we are getting 10 terawatts is the energy that we are using today. Now, total global population uses 10 terawatts of energy on a day whereas, 3.9 to 10 raised to 26 uh, watts of energy is actually um, falling on the surface of the earth every second. The huge difference of energy shows that we have lot of opportunity to trap this uh, electricity uh, or trap this energy convert it into usable electricity and use it. So, what are the different kinds of technologies which are available to use this? This is what would be my major discussion today and just before starting that uh, I would actually also try to sh uh, mention how we measure this uh, radiation. Now, there are uh, we have something which is called as the standard flux meter uh, which actually measures the amount of intensity uh, which is falling on unit area, but it is a sensor which actually senses in terms of uh, the wavelength. So, which means that we have a parameter which is called as solar irradiance which actually represents the amount of energy incident per unit area per unit wavelength on uh, the surface of the earth. So, this quantity is actually what is more uh, scientifically acceptable uh, to us the solar irradiance. Now, we have a solar irradiance map which is done all over the uh, surface of the earth which is represented as the solar isolation which represents the total amount of uh, solar radiation which is uh, received per unit surface area per unit wavelength across the surface globally. Now, looking at this uh, data, the graph actually shows that uh, India is in a region where we receive typically around 1534 kilowatt hour per 
kilowatt peak is what we receive which shows that typically or in terms of uh, in terms of energy we can say that 1500 kilowatts of energy is being received by india per second which means it's a huge amount of energy for us if we can uh, use this uh, energy which is incident in terms of uh, the solar energy uh, that itself can solve our energy crisis now how is this uh, done as i was saying in the beginning the sun which emits uh, radiation uh, this we have two established technologies right now one methodology is using the infrared radiations from the sun which is basically thermal radiations and convert those thermal radiations or convert the thermal radiations into heat source and use that heat to generate electricity. The alternative method is use the uh, incident sunlight and convert that into electricity. So, these two classifications are what is normally uh, used as on date. So, so you have solar thermal uh, energy processes and you have photovoltaic processes where thermal processes are actually indirect processes where using the sunlight heat is generated and using the heat uh, electricity is generated whereas photovoltaics is a methodology where the sunlight is used directly to generate electricity. So, the first part of my talk I would be concentrating today only on what are the different methodologies in which uh, solar thermal energy is utilized and the techniques. Uh, I would start off by saying that uh, our uh, ONGC uh, that is our oil and natural gas uh, corporation it started a uh, uh, very uh, uh, what do you say a novel uh, plant uh, somewhere in uh, Gurgaon uh, which location has not been disclosed, but uh, the project started uh, say around 10 years back where the idea was to generate electricity directly from uh, the heat which is falling on the surface of the earth. Uh, if you look at this uh, image here you can see that uh, more than uh, typically 2.2 uh, kilowatts of electricity is actually being generated by this plant. Uh, it is supported by US uh, uh, research where primarily heat which is falling on the surface of the earth is collected and it is uh, pushed into something which is called as a Stirling uh, engine which converts this heat into electricity. This plant has been running for the past 10 years on a on a, what an R&D basis. You also uh, uh, can see the example of the Mira uh, solar thermal project which is uh, implemented uh, in the United uh, Arab Emirates. Uh, here what they have done is uh, inside a desert uh, they have installed uh, around around 3 3.5 hectares of solar thermal collectors thermal energy collectors using which electricity is generated around 1000 megawatt uh, facility or 1000 megawatt electricity is actually generated using this plant so what is the technology behind uh, these plants basically broadly classifying a solar thermal generation power plant is uh, is something like our old steam engine. In our steam engine what we used to do is we used to burn uh, say coal or we used to burn wood. Uh, by burning this what we used to do is we used to uh, use this uh, to convert water to steam and push that into the steam engine to produce uh, work or to generate electricity or to make transport. The exact same thing is done here, the only difference is that heat is directly taken from the sunlight. So, sunlight which is a very good source of heat is actually uh, used to generate steam directly or indirectly and this steam is used to generate electricity. So, uh, the solar power, um, thermal power generation systems uh, work on this primary idea of how to generate steam. Now, we have different methodologies where uh, phase change materials are the ones which are catching up the industry that is see uh, typically you can think about wax. What happens to wax? When you burn a candle the wax melts it becomes a liquid. Now, when you touch the liquid you can feel how hot it is. 
right whereas if you take the wax and put it on your skin you you, you gently feel the warmth of that uh, wax which actually solidifies immediately when the heat is lost so it is actually a phase change but during this phase change that is when it solidifies what happens is it pushes out its liquid uh, or it pushes out its heat energy the same concept is used here where you can think about uh, say you can think about a tank a tank which is having uh, a good source of wax now you collect the sunlight uh, which can push a lot of heat you change this uh, wax into liquid so what has actually happened uh, it is now hot now using this hot liquid you pass uh, water around it so what will happen this uh, wax would actually solidify when it solidifies it will push the heat to the water and water gets heated up now if you do this cyclically your water would actually reach its uh, boiling point and steam is generated and this cycle would actually result in our conversion of uh, the mechanical energy that is steam can be used to convert it into mechanical energy and the mechanical energy can be converted into electrical energy so this is one uh, technology which has actually caught on uh, the idea today of phase change materials which can actually uh, trap energy because the importance is that all the fundamental question that would have come to your mind would be what would you do when it is night time right because the sunlight is available only in the morning time this is where phase change materials actually plays a role that is you have typically around 8 hours or typically around 12 hours of time during which the phase change occurs slowly which can generate or which can liberate the heat energy to generate electricity so the slower the conversion takes place the more uh, prolonged the uh, generation process and greater time electricity can be generated <coughs> so this is one of the most important phase change technologies which is coming into play right now you also have certain uh, components which track uh, the sun this is when see typically uh, we know that the sun uh, rises in the east so what happens is if your uh, methodology of collecting light is towards the east in the morning it is overhead by afternoon and it is towards the west by evening so if you want to collect uh, the heat from the sun you need to move your collector with respect to the sun which is actually called as solar tracking which means uh, there are different methodologies of tracking a typical example is you can think about manually you go and move a uh, a uh, collector with respect to which angle your sun is so as the sun moves across the horizon you will have to move your system along with the sun now this actually been uh, mechanized and robotized which means that as your normal clock your as your clock the sun with every tilt on the sun your tracking system also tilts so that a prolonged 8 hour collection is possible so solar thermal tracking has also been implemented in solar energy systems uh, uh, some of the most common uh, solar tracking or solar thermal collection systems are uh, you would have uh, normally seen uh, see uh, in the form of a dish you would all of us uh, see dish antennas uh, think about uh, having a football ground where you have dishes uh, you can actually place the dishes in such a way that the total focal point of all the dishes is at one point so this uh, methodology is actually called as a solar tower where you have as you can see in this diagram also uh, you have uh, say around 100 uh, dishes which are focused to one point now in this one point would be where your phase change material is so that uh, the entire heat which is concentrated by these 100 uh, dishes actually causes huge rise in uh, temperature so typically around uh, temperatures of up to 780 degree celsius is uh, derivable by such uh, techniques so solar tower is one common uh, technique which is used for delivering very high temperatures you also have actually um, fresnel lenses where actually it is something like uh, gratings that we uh, handle uh, they can actually result in uh, a very high concentration of sun that is see we look at sun as one source now by using fresnel lenses we can actually have up to 30 suns which are con which are falling at one unit uh, area so which means 30 suns heat 
can be focused to one particular point to generate very high temperatures. So, burning and ignition would be very simple. I think all of us, uh, all of us know that you can use a simple uh, hand lens to burn a paper, right? It is very easy. Just focus the sunlight to one particular point, and you can burn a paper. The same technology, uh, but on a very large scale, is actually used uh, when you go for um, frontal lensed uh, solar thermal generators. Because think about the volume of water that you want to heat to produce steam. So you have a large volume, and such a 30 sun concentration is possible. So three of the possible uh, mechanisms. Uh, are basically either use uh, solar dishes or solar uh, towers or you can use frontal lenses. Now any of these systems uh, in typically in all of these systems we actually use two technologies which is commonly one is the one that I was saying to generate steam from steam generate uh, our uh, mechanical energy and convert uh, use that mechanical energy to generate electricity. The alternative was the one that I was talking about the ONGC uh, which has been uh, which is riding on a pilot run right now which uses Stirling engines where the Stirling engine actually converts your uh, basically what happens is your thermal energy is directly converted into an electricity electrical energy without having an uh, intermediate uh, phase over change. So, which means efficient C or efficient uh, conversion is possible from thermal energy to electrical, uh, electrical energy. Whereas in the other two cases thermal energy is converted into mechanical energy and then mechanical energy is converted into electrical energy which means you have an intermediate step where you have loss of thermodynamical efficiencies. In Stirling uh, engines direct conversion of thermal energy to uh, electrical energy takes place which actually guarantees more than uh, 70 to 80 percent efficiencies is possible. Now, uh, based on the kind of uh, structures which are uh, needed for uh, solar thermal collection, now any of these uh, devices that you use have to be uh, basically uh, coated with something that which can absorb heat. So, uh, typically there are four mechanisms which are four technologies which are commonly used for coating uh, heat absorbing materials, they are chemical methods. Uh, basically can, we can think about uh, your car see most of us would uh, would have seen our car getting painted in a, a workshop. In a similar way you can think about coating a surface using a spray painter a coating paint which actually absorbs the heat. I think uh, right now we also have um, burger and Asian Asian paints who are coming with paints which you can coat at the top of your house which, uh, which are said to absorb all the UV radiations. Soon you will also have paints which come uh, which would be absorbing all the infrared radiations. So, spray coating is one method of, of coating surfaces. You can also have uh, electroplating which is one of the most oldest techniques uh, of coating surfaces uh, using a, a galvanic uh, cell configuration where the surface is more of a metal which gets coated with your, uh, co um, your material which can absorb heat. Then you can also have vapor deposition methodologies which is again uh, not uh, industrially uh, um, scalable, but it can be delivered on small area coatings where you actually inside a vacuum system the coating is possible. And again you have oxide layer uh, coatings which can be used for uh, absorption of heat radiations. Now, we would actually think about going a little more into depth of how uh, heating can actually be used to store. Now, if you look at uh, the ideology, uh, typically we can think about uh, a tank, uh, think about uh, your tank which is in your houses, right. Uh, you have a pump which puts a water the uh, into your tank, right. So, imagine your tank uh, has the outlet at the bottom, you have the inlet where the water is getting uh, pushed in. Now, if you think about a solar uh, system which actually can heat this water, we will have to uh, connect the surface which absorbs this heat to this primarily tank. So, the surface which absorbs heat has to be connected to the tank using two pipes which actually would be in such a fashion where from the bottom of your tank through a pipe. Now imagine that uh, sunlight falls on your collector. Now as the collector gets heated up, uh, the water which is coming into the collector also gets heated up. 
and fundamentally uh, hot water is less denser than cold water. So, if your uh, heated substrate is back connected to your tank, what will happen is this water will actually flow back to your tank and it will move up your tank. So, what happens is the top of your tank gets collected with hot water as time progresses and the cold water keeps going into your uh, heating substrate. So, this is your fundamental uh, methodology that is normally what we use is the gravimetry uh, the gravimetric technique or uh, is used to maintain an equilibrium between your uh, solar thermal collector and the storage tank. So, this again puts an advantage where you do not have to have a different uh, electricity uh, um, uh, wastage just to create this equilibrium. Natural uh, gravime uh, gravimetry helps in attaining solar uh, thermal equilibrium inside the tank. So, I would uh, go into more of these uh, details based on this fundamental idea. Now, if you look at the industry today. Uh, the, the most successful solar thermal generation systems are based on uh, vacuum tube solar systems. Now, if you can uh, look into the uh, image also, see uh, all of you would have seen uh, solar thermal uh, system sitting on most of the uh, 5 star hotels and in some affluent homes and say in middle class homes also of today, where uh, you would actually find a rectangular uh, frame inside which you would see it is black in color uh, which is actually tilted uh, uh, or slanted and then uh, you would have a tank sitting on top of it. Now, what is the technology behind it is very simple it is actually uh, a greenhouse gas or a greenhouse effect which is stimulated by tilting at 45 degree we are actually trying to create a gradient such that uh, what happens is that. Uh, water tank see if you have a water tank is sitting at the top of it uh, the water would actually flow down because of the gravity right. Now, if you have the pipe which is laid down across this uh, tank what will happen is because of the heating which is inside uh, inside the uh, storage tank water would propagate uh, topwards. So, at the bottom you would have cold water at the top you would have hot water this gravimetric circulation ensures a thermal equilibrium in the entire water system in uh, time. So, the most common uh, technique which is used today is or the most famous technique today used is actually the evacuated uh, tube solar system where inside this uh, greenhouse uh, greenhouse you can find cylindrical tubes which are evacuated and within the evacuated tubes you have finer uh, glass tubes which actually are used for water transport. So, basically because uh, air is a good insulator it avoids uh, sorry uh, see vacuum you have a vacuum tube. So, what happens is a vacuum actually insulates heat to get propagated. So, the inside tube which carries the water gets heated up quickly and you have a vacuum surrounding the tube which avoids heat to be propagated the glass tube whereas, you have air inside the uh, main insulator or the main tank which actually gets heated up very fast. So, uh, you can actually uh, provide a longer duration of heating which uh, enables say you have a morning of around 5 to 6 hours of heating duration you even after that even at night 12 o'clock you will be able to get hot water from your from your solar geyser. So, a vacuum assisted uh, solar tubes are the technology which is actually uh, very famous today, but uh, say around 5 years back uh, the solar heaters that are kept in our homes are not uh, vacuum uh, compatible tubes they are sim uh, they are typically only they would specifically have a black surface on the black surface you would have copper tubes which are laid out and it is uh, the circulation of water happens through these water tubes such uh, uh, systems are called as a flat plate storage tanks they are called as flat plate storage tanks they were there in the market up to say around 2017, but now we after 2017 these um, evacuated solar tubes are actually catching up because of the efficiency being higher than the flat tube collectors. You also have something which, are, which is called as the thermo uh, dynamic plates. 
Now, what happens in the case of a thermodynamic plate is that uh, we have to think about again say imagine a blackboard and across the blackboard uh, imagine you have a, a, a front surface which is actually corrugated. Now, if you have a front surface which is corrugated uh, what happens is the surface area is larger and, be, and below this uh, you have a cold surface. So, when uh, sunlight falls on a corrugated surface since there is a larger surface area this front surface gets heated up faster than the back surface which is actually uh, at a lower temperature. So, you actually have a have a thermo gradient you have a difference in temperature which can actually uh, result in the intermediate layer serving as a thermal source. So, actually what happens is the water is flowed in between these two layers that is the front corrugated area and the back flat area the liquid is passed which actually gets heated up very fast such solar thermodynamic uh, solar thermal collectors are also available in the mar market, but uh, they are used for more of industrial uh, specific applications rather than for our water heating applications. They are used in industries specifically like in the o-ring industry you know, where you want a metal ore to be heated out or you want a metal uh, metal segregation to take place or you want it to be in say the petroleum industry where you want uh, uh, distillation to take place. In such places uh, thermodynamic solar panels are used as source of uh, heating. You also have solar air collectors basically as I said earlier instead of passing a fluid in between these two layers if you simply uh, pass air, air gets heated up and hot air can be used for a lot of purpose I would also be coming to that. You also have solar thermal bowl collectors which are similar to as the earlier as I said thermal dishes right uh, in, in, in the form of a dish if you concentrate the solar radiation to a focal point where you have your uh, thermal collector the thermal collector can get heated up very quickly. So, three of the possible methodologies is, is what uh, we have actually seen uh, here you have the thermodynamic collectors you have the solar air collectors and you have the bowl collectors. You can also imagine about batched uh, water collectors batched water heaters see uh, say you want to have an application where uh, the end uh, should be at a uh, you have different applications which means uh, if you look at this diagram uh, you can see that uh, the first part of my tank uh, is at a say a temperature of 30 degree celsius the second part is at uh, say 50 degree celsius the third is at a uh, say 70 degree celsius. So, what is this batch processing again it uses the same thermodynamic principle that is water is put into a tank from the inlet it is inside a greenhouse where which is basically a glass uh, with a black surface the heating takes place to the first tank the water in this tank flows to the next tank which would actually be at a higher temperature and then subsequent to the next. So, you can have a series of tanks which actually can result in an increase in temperature. Now, how do we lay out uh, the surface is what is actually shown in uh, the next diagram as I said you can have copper tubes or you can have glass tubes which can actually be uh, straight so that you have minimum surface area or they can be patented uh, or in the form of uh, they can be actually uh, serpentine in nature like in the form of a snake or they can be corrugated or they can be linear. So, you have uh, different formats in which uh, plate collectors can be uh, schemed out in our uh, methodologies of thermal collections. Now, moving on to certain applications now you uh, what we have described so far is that you can have uh, different technologies of collecting heat uh, using surfaces which are coated for absorbing heat this is what we first mentioned. Then I mentioned that uh, you can have actually uh, vacuum tubes which can be used for collecting heat. Then we talked about uh, having uh, thermo uh, dynamic plate collectors where either you can have liquid uh, source or you can have an air source for collecting heat. Now, what do you do with this collected heat? One of the most uh, practical applications that uh, we today uh, use uh, with these heated uh, sources is called as a solar dryer. 
Now a uh, solar dryer as you can see in the diagram typically consists of an input unit uh, where actually you can have air as the input, you can have a solar uh, thermal connector which actually heats up this air, you can have a blower which actually pushes this hot air to your uh, entity which actually uses the hot air. Now, you have lot of applications have come up, but some of the most basic applications has been in, uh, in food processing. Now, uh, I think uh, today the market is rich uh, with colored products like uh, see I think uh, most of us are attracted to red chili de depending upon what the color of the red is because all of us know that red itself has different variants like uh, the Kashmiri chili or uh, the Tamil Nadu chili. So, depending upon the color, how do you, how is this color obtained? Now, heating is the process which actually gives color that is you can get deep red to a very light red based on the temperature at which your food product is heated. And see, uh, if you go for direct heating, uh, you cannot control the temperature. So, that is where actually uh, solar heating has actually caught the market of the food processing uh, units, where you can actually control the temperature uh, on a very systematic matter uh, without affecting the natural color of the food product. Now, even if you look at our banana, you see I often say you are uh, you can get 1 kilo of banana for say around 40 rupees, whereas um, 10 grams of dried banana is around 60 rupees. So, this is a huge uh, difference basically because your color of the banana uh, would change as you uh, dry it out in different systems, but in solar dried products you do not find a change in color. So, that is where actually the cost uh, is very competitive in terms of the technology. So, uh, typically as I was saying a solar a dryer is basically a technology which is actually used in food processing industry say for so, uh, drying of vegetables, uh, drying of fish, I can show uh, as you go down the slides, I will be showing you certain uh, slides on how uh, fish drying has actually been used in Maharikulam uh, here. Um, we also have um, uh, what um, chili drying plants in uh, um, Pala, uh, you also have um, copra drying units in say in Palakkad and Coimbatore. All such uh, food processing units which use solar drying have already caught on the market. Now, we can also have uh, different types of uh, solar dryers. The most uh, simple and uh, type of dryer is the, nat uh, the natural convection uh, dryers where the flow of air is not assisted by a blower. It is simply the uh, natural flow as you see in this diagram, the flow comes from the uh, natural flow of wind which is uh, taken into the system it is uh, the solar thermal uh, generator heats up the air, it is passed into the chamber and it convex naturally heating up all our all other products which is on its way. So, the natural convection allows slow drying and heating of products, whereas in forced convection you would have a blower as shown in the diagram, a uh, forced convection system the blower sucks in dry air and pushes it. Uh, it into the uh, dryer, uh, no into the uh, thermal uh, collector, the thermal collector heats up uh, the air and it pushes it into the collective area where it uh, heats up uh, the object and again the collective area is uh, thermally isolated from the atmosphere. So, that it can have a greater uh, efficiency and again the push of the thermal blower uh, convects the hot air out of the system. You also have something which is called as a tunnel dryer, uh, tunnel dryers as shown in the diagram as uh, is sim it is similar to the storage tank system which successively where the temperature gradient can be maintained. That is you can have a manual input at one end, you can have successive uh, dryers which are at different different temperatures. So, your uh, product can be rammed in from a lower temperature to higher temperature and rammed out successively. So, that you can actually uh, actually rammed dryers are where you can actually think about cooking processes. See um, I would uh, normally say the uh, the new dosha making tawa which is actually used in some of the uh, Tamil Nadu area you actually pour uh, the uh, uh, the mav at one particular point of place and it goes into a, a through a, a conveyor belt into a dryer which is around 30 centimeters long. 
it actually moves to a temperature gradient where the temperature gradient changes from around 55 degree Celsius to around 80 degree Celsius and then ramps out slowly. So, such sequential thermal uh, drying systems can is what a, 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 a tunnel dryer is called. Now, if you can look at this diagram, you have uh, the input uh, conveyor belt which actually pushes the material into the uh, successive dryers and you have the product which is coming out at the lower end of it. And I was actually uh, earlier as I said in Marari column, uh, it was the first uh, fish drying unit was uh, opened up, but we also have a Chavak card which is opened very recently. And again uh, recently also in uh, uh, SIFT actually came up with a new technology for hybrid uh, solar uh, drying systems, where actually uh, fish is again dried using the solar uh, thermal collector and in case the solar dryer is not working. KCB uh, power is used uh, for uh, heating. Now, another application of uh, thermal uh, solar thermal is in solar stills actually. Now, uh, see typically um, if you want uh, to collect um, and make drinkable water out of uh, sea water, the diagram actually shows the physical uh, structure of how it can be done. Uh, typically, again we have a a greenhouse structure here, where you have a glass uh, as the open end which allows the sunlight to enter into a, a tank, uh, water or your uh, input source which is basically your salt water gets heated up. Now, this heated uh, heated water it actually evaporates and it condenses on the glass which is slanted at 45 degree and uh, the water rolls down the glass surface and is collected outside and uh, the uh, salt which actually forms the brine is at the bottom of the uh, collector and can be drained out. So, solar stills are used similarly solar distillation units are used in laboratories uh, using the same principle where you can actually have your tap water. You can bring in your tap water uh, into a solar uh, still, you can evaporate it uh, using the solar thermal in the same manner, distilled it and then again follow a double distillation of the same kind and obtain uh, distilled water for the uh, laboratory uh, usages also. So, solar stills are an again uh, 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 revolution in reducing and the um, use of energy uh, for uh, distilling purposes. Solar uh, heating is also used for uh, generating uh, what thermally stable homes. Now, this is not very famous in uh, India, but uh, in European uh, nations, we have solar uh, thermal buildings. So, what happens is uh, the eastern end of the homes uh, has a, a, a small area, which is actually uh, say a phase change material, which can be it can be glass, uh, glass wool or it can be some wax. So, that when the sun rises, say up to around uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, the eastern side actually gets all the heat uh, which is passed in by the glass or glazed window into the homes. Now, the as you can see in the diagram also, this uh, glazed window provides heating to the source which actually undergoes um, what phase change and generates a heat. Now, natural convection can allow the air in the building to be heated up and it circulates throughout the room. This is the uh, uh, um, a passive uh, mechanism of getting uh, the rooms heated up. You can also have a direct uh, method of heating in the same with only difference is that uh, you need to have a, a blower which is connected again which circulates this heat across the buildings. Now, the building walls can be uh, can be associated with a phase change material which is actually called as a tromb wall. The tromb wall is where in uh, it is actually named after the discoverer Trombe who actually says that the walls of the material need to be uh, uh, need to be impregnated with the phase change material. So, that as the heat passes through the room, the material actually can absorb the heat and keep the room uh, hotter for a longer period of time. So, these are the two technologies which are used uh, as uh, a passive heating and the trome wall methodology of keeping the rooms uh, heated up. So, uh, this uh, module uh, which is basically uh, aimed at uh, solar thermal generation, uh, I would summarize uh, by saying that see uh, we have a methodology where the solar heat energy can be directly converted into electricity, which is the most efficient methodology 
because no other uh, moving parts are involved in it. So, wear and tear can be eliminated and again it is a very clean method of because there is no use of any fossil fuel involved in conversion of, uh, of, uh, of thermal energy from the sun into electricity. Now, the other advantage here is that we can uh, use this energy on a switchable basis that is if you want you can use the thermal energy or if you it is not required you do not have to use the energy. And again see we today all the technologies depend upon storing uh, electricity right you need a battery to store uh, electricity. So, uh, batteries are to store electricity and battery cost is what is most unbearable in uh, today's uh, technology. Whereas, if you look at heat as a source of energy the technology is cheaper to store heat rather than store electricity. So, maybe uh, if more and more R and D work goes into it you can have materials which can store heat which are more efficient than storing electricity directly. So, that you can convert uh, the stored heat energy to electricity. So, such changes may come in the near future. So, I will end this part of this uh, course. With, uh, with the summary that uh, solar energy is the energy of the future and solar thermal is the energy which needs to be uh, researched uh, in order to come up with a better solution of storing heat and converting it to electricity. Thank you.